Good morning, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us in our fourth lecture of the La Salle Sustainability Lecture Series organized by De La Salle University in cooperation with the International Association of La Salle Universities. So to start us off, um, to give us a few words of welcome is Brother Jack Uran, of, who is the Vice President of Mission of Manhattan College. Brother Jack. Good morning, Dr. Viso. Thank you very much. And good morning, one and all in the Philippines. And good evening, one and all here in uh, the United States and elsewhere. Um, thank you so very much for this opportunity to be with you. All of us here at Manhattan College, uh, the home of Dr. Avalencia and Dr. Chasek, are delighted to be with you, to share with you two of our very best and distinguished faculty members. Um, you'll hear more about them uh, and you'll know why we cherish them in a few moments. I'd just like to say just a few words about our two universities, Manhattan and De La Salle University. Manhattan College and DLSU, you know, we share many things in common as Dr. Aviso mentioned, we are both members of the International Association of La Salle Universities. And by virtue of her continued leadership as the board chair of the Yailu Research Committee, Dr. Carmelita Kobenko, Chancellor Emeritus at De La Salle University has brought us together. Thank you, Carmelita. You know, Manhattan College is about 48 years older than De La Salle University. But we have about only one third of the number of students that De La Salle University has. Here at Manhattan College, we have six prestigious schools, School of Business, the School of Liberal Arts, the School of Continuing and Professional Studies, School of Education and Health, and the two schools from which our two faculty tonight come from, or this morning come from, the School of Engineering and the School of Liberal Arts. Of course, there are other similar, there's some similarities about De La Salle University in Manhattan. You know, both of us cherish the color green. Uh, it's our school colors. We're delighted to be among you. De La Salle University, I understand, moved to its new location in 1921. And it was about that same time that Manhattan College moved to its current location also. Both De La Salle and Manhattan are centers of excellence recognized internationally and nationally. Why, you might wonder, are both of our universities centers of excellence? I posit that it's because of the quality of the people, namely the faculty and the students who populate our universities that make us centers of excellence. For it is there our passion, passionate commitment to this international Italian educational movement that makes us so powerfully uh, successful. Just recently, the Institute of the Brothers of the Christian Schools published this document called the Declaration on La Salian Education, Challenges, Convictions, and Hopes. And once again, when we read that document, we find that care for the earth, care for the people of the earth in a just and equitable way, focused on sustainable human development, that benefits everyone, especially the poor, that is a fundamental value in our shared Lasallian educational mission. Thank you for this opportunity to be together, but more importantly, thank you for all of your efforts, those of your heart and your soul, those of your intellect and your expertise, for what you do each and every day is most significant 
It's transformative. You are signs of hope for a better today and tomorrow. Indivisa Manet. Thank you very much for that, Brother Jack. Now I'd like to call in the director of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research of De La Salle University, Professor Alvin Colaba, to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aviso, um, Brother Jack Cran, uh, our Chancellor Emeritus, uh, Carmelita Kibenko, our Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, Dr. Raymond Tan, our distinguished speakers, uh, our participants from all over the world. Good evening from New York. Good morning from here in the Philippines. Good afternoon from our colleagues uh, in Mexico and other in the part of the world. Good morning. The Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research plays host to this La Salle Sustainability Lecture Series primarily uh, because uh, our center has been built for over 10 years now, which has envisioned to make significant contributions to the growing scientific knowledge in engineering and technology. It has been engaged in various uh, research and modeling of industrial systems and development of innovative processes and products that has led to the utilization of sustainable technologies. This also facilitates the effective transfer of these technologies from the academic research community to industry and society in the pursuit of sustainable development. The center has produced over 6,000 Scopus Index publications from our best researchers in the university. And we are happy uh, to contribute to the growing body of scientific knowledge in the area of sustainable development. Today, we are delighted to welcome two of the distinguished uh, speakers from our colleagues at the Manhattan College in New York City. Let me have the honor now and pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Dr. J. Patrick Abulensha is an Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering at Manhattan College. Dr. Abulensha received his BS degree in chemical engineering from Manhattan College, his PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering from Johns Hopkins University. His graduate research examined the role of the shear stress in blood thrombus formation, as well as the gene regulation of chondrocytes. Dr. Abulensha's postgraduate work was done at the School of Veterinary Medicine De Department of Small Animal Surgery at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where he investigated tissue engineering strategies of mesenchymal stem cells in repairing both bone and cartilage. He has been a Balik scientist at De La Salle University, Manila in 2008 and 2012, working with Dr. Susan Gallardo in creating a biodegradable water filtration system that has been patented in the Philippines. A Tau Beta Pi inductee and active member of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, Dr. Abulencia's current research interests spans a broad range that includes bio, bioengineering, engineering, pedagogy, and of course, sustainability. Our second speaker, Dr. Pamela Chasek, is a professor of political science at Manhattan College. Dr. Chasek received her BA degree in political science from Middlebury College and her PhD in international relations from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Chasek's research focuses on multilateral environmental negotiations and international environmental governance as a means for countries and non-state actors to address and resolve environmental problems at the international level. She is the author and editor of numerous articles and books 
including transforming multilateral diplomacy, the inside story of the Sustainable Development Goals, The Roads from Rio, lessons learned from 20 years of multilateral environmental negotiations and global environmental politics, uh, eighth edition. Dr. Chasex is also the co-founder and executive editor of the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, a reporting service on United Nations environment and development negotiations. She has written about and followed UN sustainable development negotiations for over 29 years. She has served as a consultant to the United Nations Environment Program, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Forum on Forests, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, and the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, including the Division of Sustainable Development and the Division for Social Development. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome with warm uh, applause uh, our uh, distinguished speakers to speak on building and transportation energy use in New York City during the COVID-19 pandemic from engineering towards sustainability policy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Abolencia and Dr. Chasek. Patrick, Patrick you're muted. Yeah. Rookie mistake. Apologies to everyone. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Calaba, for introducing me. And hopefully you could hear me now. And thank you and Dr. K. Aviso uh, and Dr. Raymond Ten for inviting Dr. Chasek and I to this talk. Um, De La Salle University in Manila uh, has been both a uh, friend and family over the years, and it's an honor and a privilege uh, for me to collaborate another time in this forum. Uh, so with that, uh, a pleasant good morning to those in Manila and in the Eastern Hemisphere, and a pleasant good evening to those in New York and in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, as Dr. Kalab mentioned, my name is Patrick Abalencia from the Department of Chemical Engineering here at Manhattan College. And I will begin this talk with my colleague, Dr. Pam Chasek from the Department of Political Science, also at Manhattan College. Our talk is titled Building and Transportation Energy Use in New York City During the COVID-19 Pandemic from Engineering Towards, sustainable, towards Sustainability Policy. Connected together at this moment through the magic of the internet, we gather here together and by association as one LaSallean community. I'd like to give at least a broad overview of what I plan to talk about, uh, at least in the first part of our, our talk today. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about sustainability and our responsibility um, to, uh, to, our, to our, our world uh, and just our personal responsibility in, in that regard. Uh, I also wanna talk a little bit about the geography of New York City for those who are not familiar um, with, our, with, our, uh, with, with New York City. Um, and a little bit about the COVID-19 timeline. I, th I thought it was a little bit important for me to, uh, to go talk about the, the backstory of our project. Um, so I wanted to at least um, give a little bit of background about that. Um, the problem statement of our project, the scope and assumptions in what we analyze, uh, the major findings that we have and moving forward in what we could do. So I would like to begin the talk by asking all of you to reflect on our personal responsibility on sustainability. Some days we get mired on our day-to-day -day work, whether it be teaching students or running experiments in the lab, and sometimes we lose sight of a purpose. Sometimes we don't see any purpose at all. We may be able to relish in our excellent teaching evaluations or that new publication we could add to our CVs, but what I would like us to think about at this moment is beyond academic. What I have on the slide is the result of my personal reflection on sustainability from four different perspectives and how it is up to each of us to contribute to its success. So let me go ahead and dive a little deeper into these. First, as a member of the Salian community, uh, ILU had disseminated research themes back in 2013 for member institutions to consider embarking on. One of the three, which is the sustainability and the environment research theme, specifically calls on us to work on this area. 
So in this vein, I'd like to cite a paper written by Dr. Arnie Ascaraga in AXIS, which is of course the Journal of Italian Higher Education, which resonated a lot with me as I was preparing for this talk. So in this particular piece, he essentially calls on all Italian institutions to strategically engage and intervene. So essentially for all of us to work together, a goal that has this sustainability seminar series that Drs. Calaba, Viso, and Tan may hopefully catalyze. Second, as a person who identifies as a Catholic, the New Testament story of Jesus feeding the multitudes highlights that people will be provided for, but without wastefulness. John writes in chapter six, verse 12, when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. In other words, use what you need. I looked at other religious texts such as the Old Testament and the Quran, and I could not find an example that encouraged people to consume in excess. But with my luck, and since this will be immortalized on YouTube, there's probably some obscure religious sect out there called the Church of Perpetual Consumption that will come back and fact check me, but somehow I don't think so. Third, as an engineer, I found an example in the Code of Ethics from the National Society of Professional Engineers. As Dr. Kalaba said earlier, I'm a chemical engineer uh, by training, and there's indeed an example in the AICHE code, but wanted to give a broader example to include our brothers and sisters in civil, electrical, and mechanical engineering, as well as the other disciplines like environmental and uh, aeronautic engineering. So up there on the slide, the NSP code states, engineers are encouraged to adhere to the principles of sustainable development in order to protect the environment for future generations. Finally, as a global citizen, the United Nations has enumerated several sustainable development goals, which Dr. Chasek will speak about more in depth later on. But what I want to tell you all, and what I want to communicate from this slide is that sustainability is important, it is our responsibility, and we are asked to contribute to its success from several aspects of our lives. So let me go ahead and give a broad overview about the geography uh, of New York City for, again, for those of you who have not been to New York City. Um, I'll start with Manhattan, uh, which is, uh, I'll start with Manhattan, which is uh, right in the center. Um, it's the smallest with respect to area, probably the most famous of all. Uh, that's where uh, a lot of the tourist attractions are, uh, Empire State Building, the Broadway, uh, theater district. Uh, so it's the smallest with respect to area, but it's the most densely populated. Uh, moving northward up into the Bronx, uh, it's the only borough in the United States mainland. Uh, and for those of you who are baseball fans, the New York Yankees uh, reside in the Bronx. Uh, and also we have a famous Sioux called the Bronx Sioux up in that area. Continuing onward uh, is the borough of Queens. That's where I grew up. So I have a special passion for uh, for Queens. Uh, it's known to be the most eth ethnically diverse borough. Uh, for those of you who are uh, interested in tennis, uh, the US Open uh, is held in the borough of Queens and my beloved New York Mets are also in the borough of Queens. It's just south of Queens is the borough of Brooklyn. It's the borough with the largest population and also known for its independent arts and culture scene. And finally, to round it all up is the borough of Staten Island. Uh, it's the borough with the least urban feel, and I don't mean to be mean about that, uh, but it's, there's a lot of parkland uh, and it's very residential and very suburban uh, in Staten Island. Manhattan College is located on the Northwest corner of the Bronx. Uh, so if you take the one train to the very last stop, that's where we're located. So uh, again, as Brother Jack sort of mentioned, please do uh, come and visit us if you are ever in town. So I wanna at least look back on the events of last March and at least set the stage of uh, how this project came about. Um, so uh, we started, uh, COVID started back in March of 2020. Um, and on March 7th, uh, Governor Cuomo, um, which is uh, the governor of the state of New York, uh, declared, declared a state of emergency. Um, we had a case uh, in New Rochelle, which is a neighboring uh, community in Westchester County, uh, we had a, a case of, of COVID-19 being reported there and they tried to uh, isolate this person, but it sort of uh, escalated and uh, the governor decided to, uh, to uh, declare a state of emergency. Uh, quickly, the, the school realized that this was, uh, this was getting worse and we moved to online learning on uh, March 11th. 
And we had a little bit of a respite. Spring break happened uh, to give us a little bit of time to think and to breathe and to try to process what's going on. But what happened at the end of spring break on the 22nd of March, uh, almost a year and a day from, from today, uh, we had the stay at home mandate that uh, the governor uh, declared, uh, essentially asking everyone who is not a non who is a, uh, who is not an essential worker to, to stay at home. So uh, on March 22nd, uh, that was when it all started. This is a picture of my office last March 22nd, uh, 2020. And I have a lot of mixed feelings uh, looking at this picture um, because at that time, um, I was genuinely afraid. I, I had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, and you have all these thoughts running in your head of, oh, uh, you know, what if you get sick? What if you die? And, and so forth and so on. Um, so I, I tweeted out this picture, uh, not knowing what was going to happen because, you know, the, the New York City was closing down and um, I wanted to at least immortalize it uh, so that I could think about, um, uh, think about that day uh, when I left the office. And here it is, you know, a year later, uh, reminiscing upon it. So this is a picture of Times Square that was published in USA Today, uh, also on March 22nd of last year in 2020. Um, and you'll notice that Times Square is particularly empty. For those who have been to New York City, you'll know that Times Square is never empty. It's always filled with tourists. Uh, it's always filled with people. Uh, and just to at least further that point, um, the Times Square station uh, is the busiest all, of all the New York City subway stations followed by Grand Central, which is just a few blocks um, just east of this. Uh, so in this particular picture, um, this is uh, 7th Avenue looking south. Uh, the building here is uh, one Times Square for those of you who are familiar with the New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve ball drop, uh, that's the building where it actually happens. So. As New York City was closing down, I was thinking to myself, there are a lot of people who are staying home. And because there are a lot of people who are staying home, there are, there's going to be a change in the way people use their energy. So I wrote the problem statement on top of the slide. It says, uh, with New York City shut down and many people working from home, how has the distribution of energy consumption changed? So that was what, at least what I was thinking at the time. And I wanted to at least further this and examine um, how the dynamics played out with respect to, to energy consumption in New York City. So I want to at least outline the scopes and assumptions that we use for our particular model. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start with this first one. Uh, it says workers will be commuting from a broad region within the tri-state. Um, and the first group I wanna talk about is what we call the in-commuters. And the in-commuters are going to be defined as those coming from New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island, and the Northern New York counties. So uh, before I go any further, what I want everyone to at least uh, remember is that I'm going to be splitting up all the commuters into uh, a group of three, uh, this being the first. So there's gonna be three groups, but let me go ahead and explain each one by one. So again, the first are the in-commuters. Uh, so let me go ahead and explain what this is. Uh, this is going to be uh, the state of New Jersey, just to the west of New York City, which is on the southern end of New York State. Uh, this is Long Island, also part of New York State. Uh, and this is the state of Connecticut. Now, this is, at least broadly speaking, this is where a lot of the commuters who go to New York City come from. They commute from these regions. And just to at least put some uh, some names to the faces, you know, I, we, we blew up this uh, map of the individual counties close to New York City. Uh, New York City is uh, down where my cursor is. Uh, it's a little bit small, it's labeled one to five for the different boroughs that I, I uh, articulated earlier. Uh, and then just to the west of New York City, uh, we have the state of New Jersey, Bergen County and Hudson County. Uh, and then just to the north of uh, New York City, we have Westchester County, Rockland County and Putnam. Uh, to the east, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, uh, Long Island. Uh, so Nassau and Suffolk counties. And then to the uh, northeast is the state of Connecticut, Fairfield, uh, Litchfield, and New Haven counties. So what we wanted to do is at least capture the behaviors of the people coming from these areas who are going to go to New York City to, to, go, to go to work. So this being said, um, we also wanted to define uh, two other groups of, uh, of, of commuters. 
um, the in commuters coming from the outer boroughs. And then we also have two other groups uh, called the outer boroughs, um, Brooklyn, uh, Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island. And uh, so everything but Manhattan. And then the third group are the commuters coming from Manhattan itself. So uh, I've already shown uh, the, the map of New York City. So uh, Manhattan is the island that's in the middle and the outer boroughs is everything else but Manhattan, which is Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Now, these commuters had to go work somewhere. And we said that the workers will be commuting to the Midtown Business District. Now, we chose these particular zip codes uh, because this is where the highest concentration of office buildings uh, in the Midtown area. Uh, so it's outlined uh, on the map that you see up on the screen, uh, south of 59th Street. Uh, this is uh, Central Park, just to give a little bit of, uh, of a landmark. Uh, this is south of 59th Street, uh, north of 42nd Street, 42nd and Broadway is where Times Square is, and essentially going east to west along the whole island of Manhattan. So uh, there's, again, a high concentration of office buildings in this area. So we want to at least capture um, uh, capture all the data of the commuters going to this particular area. Okay, number three, the building parameters collectively reflect the office buildings in this area. So had we had a little bit more rigorous way to do this, the ideal way is to track all the people going into the Midtown District, figure out their behaviors and try to uh, figure out uh, how much energy they're consuming in the meantime, coming from wherever they are coming from. Uh, so instead of doing that, what we decided to do is to model a Midtown building that collectively reflects the characteristics of all the bu buildings in the Midtown area. So, uh, so doing so, we discovered that an average Midtown building would have 22 floors. Uh, the number of occupants would be 1,927 people, and that's uh, assuming 93% occupancy. So typically what that means is that all the office buildings, at least from the data that we collected, uh, were not 100% full, they're only 93% occupied. So we, we kept that, uh, uh, that parameter in. Um, the floor square footage was 300,046 square feet, and the site EUI was 26 uh, million uh, plus KBTU. Now, uh, in order for us to uh, figure this out, we had to collect the data. But before I go ahead and, and push the slide, um, uh, please go ahead and, and I want you all to at least think about the number of occupants and just let's go ahead and round up to 2000 people, uh, just because when the numbers um, uh, come out in the, in the slides uh, that I'm going to show, it's just easier to conceive in terms of a pop population of 2000 rather than 1927. Uh, so the way we collected this data was from benchmarking studies uh, done by uh, the, the city of New York. So as an example, uh, you have building data, um, uh, building numbers, addresses, uh, street names, and also what kind of building, whether it be an office building or an apartment or residence. Uh, so we were able to at least collect the data that way and come up with the parameters I had on the previous slide. Number four, we wanted to define what pre and COVID cases meant. So pre-COVID means that workers, they traveled to the Midtown office, they went to work, and then they traveled back to the residence. So there's a travel component uh, in that. Uh, B, post-COVID, uh, after lockdown, there was no longer any travel uh, that you will see from these commuters. Um, so the workers essentially remained in their residence. Finally, so we wanted to, to again see how these commuters in this building uh, would be consuming their energy. So we defined the energy consumption using these parameters. So how much HVAC did the building that they're actually in be using? So the, the building in Midtown and they're all, then the residents, um, how much energy is being used for lighting? Um, plug in process load. So think about folks putting uh, their plug into their, uh, their, their computers into their plugs. So uh, essentially your computer, your computer load. Uh, D, other, um, is essentially uh, conveyance. So think about your building. Uh, you need to have power in order for, for people to go up and down in your elevators and your escalators. So that, that's going to be also uh, another, um, uh, that's going to be another, um, uh, another load. Uh, and finally, transportation. Uh, we have several modes of transportation that we wanted to at least examine. Uh, we have car, commuter, bus, and rail. Uh, city bus, subway, and other. So um, commuter bus and rail uh, are, are, 
our, our trains that essentially go out to the outer to the to the suburbs. So think about your in commuter population. So for us in New York City, we have New Jersey Transit, we have uh, Metro North, and we also have the Long Island Railroad as an example. So uh, that's what commuter rail uh, versus the subway uh, would be. Okay, so for the in commuter profile, remember these are the people who are living in the outer counties. Of those 2000 people who are working in that building, 501 will be coming from these outer communities. And we wanted to figure out what mode of transportation they would be using to get into Midtown. So it turns out that 68% of them would be traveling by car, 6% uh, would be traveling by commuter bus and train, 8% would be traveling by bus, 24, I'm sorry, 14 by subway, uh, and 4% using other means of transportation such as walking and biking. For those coming from the outer boroughs, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, uh, of the 2,000 people working that building, a little less than half, 867, 867 people would be uh, coming in from the outer boroughs. Uh, of those people, 24% will be driving into Midtown using a car, less than 1% using commuter bus and train, 10% using the city bus, 47% using the subway, and 19% using alternative means of transportation such as walking and biking. And the last group, those who actually live in Manhattan, uh, again, a little bit, uh, about a quarter of them, uh, 559 people would be coming from Manhattan itself, 24% by car, less than 1% by commuter bus and train, 10% by bus, 47% by subway, and 19% by these alternative means. So we sort of came up with how these people were using their energies from these outside communities as well as the outer boroughs and also in Manhattan. So this is just a little bit of a snapshot of the energy use uh, of these people coming from these different communities. And obviously, uh, the further you are coming from Midtown, the more energy you're going to be using. So the further you are from Midtown, uh, it'll take a little bit more energy for you uh, to, to use. So we were able to resolve this with respect to uh, lower and Hudson Mississippi lower and mid Hudson Valley as an example, uh, inner New Jersey, which are the counties close to New York City, like Hudson and uh, Bergen, and also outer New Jersey, those a little bit further out, uh, Somerset, Hunterdon, uh, Ocean County. Um, but what we wanna do is we wanna compile all the data just to see how they would look uh, side by side. So let me go ahead and show you the slide and walk you all through this. The two bars on the left-hand side represent the data pre-COVID-19. So again, this is all before lockdown. A person would be residing at their residence, travel to work, work for eight hours, come back. Uh, while the two uh, columns on the right-hand side uh, would show the pre-post-COVID-19 where essentially people would be staying at home, working from home. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through uh, the transportation costs first. Um, so uh, pre-COVID-19, uh, the light blue represents the folks coming from uh, the in-commuting region. So these are the people who are uh, in those outer communities. Um, those folks consumed 123, uh, essentially 1,000 kilobtus per day. Uh, those who lived in the outer boroughs consumed a little bit less, 69,000 kilobtus per day. And those who uh, were residing in Manhattan would consume even less, about 6,600 kilobtus per day. Now, the dark blue segment at the very bottom of that first column represents the commercial load. So again, think about the HVAC, think about the lighting, think about uh, your process and uh, plug load. So you, essentially how much energy it takes to run the building. Uh, Pre-COVID, the number for that is about 73,000 kilo BTUs uh, per day. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what would happen on the residential side pre-COVID. So a person would go to work, but you still would have to power your own home. So there's still a cost uh, on the resident side. Uh, again, you see a little bit of difference with respect to where these folks are coming from. Now, the light green segment on the very top, uh, 77,000 kilo BTUs are for those in those outer communities. Um, those require a higher load and our suspicion at least is because people in the outer communities, uh, in those outer um, counties uh, have bigger homes compared to those who live in the cities, who live in smaller apartments. So uh, we suspect that's the reason why their, their load is, they have a bigger demand. Uh, those in the, in the green, that middle uh, segment come from the outer boroughs, 56,317 kilo BTUs per day. And those in the dark green at the very bottom, those who live in Manhattan have a demand of 52,000 
477 uh, kilo BTUs per day. Now, post COVID, we wanted to see again, what the demand is with respect to these people in the case of them living at home. Now, the commercial demand is going to, was turned out to be less compared to the pre-COVID case. And again, this makes sense because you have less people in these commercial buildings going to work. And uh, the, the number that we calculated was 65,000 uh, kilo BTUs per day in the post-COVID case. So again, you have uh, to keep the building open. So there's still some HVAC, there's some lighting, uh, but less people in the building. So there's a little bit of a demand. Uh, now, with people living at home post-COVID, you expect the residential demand to go up, which it did. Um, for those in the in the in commuting region, 91,000 kilo BTU. For those in the outer boroughs, 62,000 kilo BTUs. And for those in Manhattan, 57,000 kilo BTU. Um, so taken together, in the pre-COVID case, um, adding both the residential and the commercial uh, demands, you get about 458,000 kilo BTUs per day, whilst in the post COVID case, you get approximately 276,000 kilo BTUs per day. So that's about a savings of 40%. So we also wanted to look at the, the economic impact of these commuters. Um, so with people living at home, you would expect their energy costs to increase. Uh, so we wanted to see what the cost benefit analysis would be with respect to them having to, to pay more because they're living at home. Uh, and But yet there would be some savings on the transportation side. So again, we broke it down into the three regions, the in-commuters, which are again, those in the outer communities, uh, 0.07 uh, US dollars per person a day. Uh, those living in the outer boroughs, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, uh, and Staten Island, uh, has a cost of 0.13 US dollars per person day, while those in Manhattan uh, had an increase of 0.19 US dollars per person day. And uh, the, the, the difference in these costs are, are partially because um, different um, communities use different forms of energy. So some use natural gas, some use electricity. So uh, there's a little bit of a price difference in the commodities. So that's why there's a little bit of fluctuation there. Now, with respect to the transportation savings, uh, those in these outside uh, counties, the in-commuter group, um, had the, the biggest savings because between their, their cost for their gasoline, tolls, uh, bus fare, train fare, whatever it may be, uh, what we calculated these folks, um, folks from this particular region to be, would be $17.40 per person day. Uh, those in the outer boroughs, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island would be eight. 0.73 US dollars per person a day. And those in Manhattan, uh, they have a short commute. So only $3.20 per person a day. The final figure that I have for you is the effect of occupancy. So uh, on the vertical axis, we have energy consumption. And on the horizontal axis, we have office occupancy. So what we wanted to at least figure out was that as people are going to be let back into their buildings, the way the local government does this is by at least percent of your occupancy. So uh, as I had mentioned, the data that we had uh, showed buildings at 93% occupancy. So we went ahead and extrapolated that to 100%. Uh, so essentially this is uh, the pre-COVID case, um, assuming everyone goes back to work, while those on the left-hand side at 0% office occupancy uh, essentially is the post-COVID case, everyone working at home. So what we discovered is that at uh, occupancy, um, uh, office occupancy of 64.9%, that's sort of the tipping point with respect to where the demand is going to mostly be. So, so at those office occupancies less than 64.9, most of the demand or most of the burden lays on the residential side, whilst those at higher occupancies, most of the burdens will go towards the commercial side. So taken together, uh, these are the major conclusions that at least we have from, from this data set that we, uh, that we examined. Uh, so it turns out that working from home saves a lot of energy. Um, and that energy uh, is mostly seen in transportation. Uh, so it's the major energy consumer. And we also show that's very costly, particularly for those in the outer, outer uh, communities, outer counties. Uh, we also saw that the energy burden shifts at a building occupancy of 64.9%. So 
if you keep the occupancy below 64.9%, um, that is when most of the burden is on the residential side, while those at greater occupancies higher than 64.9, that's when the burden goes towards the office or commercial side. I just wanna acknowledge these uh, fine students, uh, Brandon Dice, Michelle Malaborska, Lauren Wright, Mallory Harishko. Um, these are the, the, the folks who really did the work. Um, I told them that I'm the one who just nearly tells the story of their work. Um, they were able to present uh, this work at the AICHE annual conference back in 2020 uh, in, in November. Um, they did a fantastic job showing their poster, uh, albeit virtually, but uh, they were able to present their work, which I'm, I'm really uh, happy with. Uh, and I just want to say I'm very proud of them. Um, they were sophomores when they first started this work, and now they are juniors. And um, uh, they, I, I feel like they've done a fantastic job with this work. So the final thought that I wish to leave you all with is the notion that sustainability is complex. So. On the slide is a cartoon depicting the story of the blind people and the elephant. So for those not familiar with the story, uh, a group of blind people each positioned uh, on different parts of the elephant attempt to describe the animal based on their particular observation. So one of the lessons from the story uh, is that we all view different aspects of the same truth and that we should be open to hearing and understanding how others observe the truth to gain better insight. So what I'm trying to communicate to all of you from the slide is that we need to approach sustainability from different lenses to effectively achieve successful outcomes, whether it be lower energy consumption, uh, a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, or clean water for all. So going full circle and quoting Dr. Ascaraga's paper, quote, excellence in the academic disciplines to grind against each other are potent mechanisms for the promotion of high impact research that truly benefits society. Only through multi and interdisciplinary research can we actively engage in research that matters in the world. So as a proud member of the Salian community and a proud member of the Manhattan College faculty, uh, our mantra of together and by association can go a long way towards our common goal of sustainability. So, and with that theme in mind, I wish to introduce my co-presenter for this talk, who will walk us through sustainability through the lens of policy here in New York City. So I wish to introduce my friend and colleague from the School of Liberal Arts and the Department of Political Science here at the college, the great and powerful Dr. Pam Chasek. Thank you. Let me share mine. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up where Patrick left off, but shift the lens a little bigger. A lot of the work um, and the information that is in my presentation is something that I use in one of my classes, which my environmental politics class, which we use as a learning lab for students to take what is happening globally, as well as nationally and in the city and apply those lessons to trying to make Manhattan College more sustainable. Um, I would have specific projects to show you, except for this year because of COVID, we re I rethought how I ran the class. And um, so I don't have a full set of, of greening Manhattan College um, ideas to present. So I'm going to stick to the information that I gave the students as we headed into this project. So how can we build back better? Um, that's been a mantra. Secretary General has said it. Our current president, Joe Biden, has said it. So when you're looking at New York City and you look at what Patrick presented and the fact that um, New York City has been very quiet. We haven't had tourists, which is a huge part of our revenue. We haven't had people commuting, commuting in from the outer boroughs as well as from the surrounding communities, um, which has made New York much quieter than it normally is, which has had a major economic impact on the city, as well as a sustainability impact. So what I'm gonna look at in my presentation is how can we do this? Looking at, we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have a city plan that was devised long before COVID, which is now called 1NYC 2050. And then what have we learned from COVID of how we can adapt all of this? And I'm gonna focus specifically on open streets and green space. So starting with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the goals were adopted in 2015 at the UN Summit for Sustainable Development. Um, all 193 member states 
um, supported these goals. There are 17 of these goals and the agenda itself is a plan of action for people, planet and prosperity. Um, it seeks to strengthen universal peace in larger freedom. If recognizing that eradicating poverty in all of its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. Um, these goals build on the Millennium Development Goals that came before them and is built on you know, what they called the five Ps, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. Just a quick note about these goals. The first six goals really updated and enhanced the Millennium Development Goals. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time on them. That doesn't mean they're not important, but I wanna focus more coming back to um, the topic for today. Goals seven through 11 are really the ones that I wanna focus on here, but particularly, and 13 as well. Um, seven is on energy, eight is decent work and economic growth, nine is industry, innovation and infrastructure, 10 is reduced inequalities, 11 is sustainable cities and communities. We can also add responsible consumption and production fits in here, as does climate action. The important thing to remember about these goals is they are all interlinked, and so we can't really look at one alone. Um, and they finish up with the environmental goals, obviously on the you know, 13, um, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and then peace, justice, and strong communities and rule of law is 16. And 17 is how all countries and all people have to work together. What's important to note though, that this is not just a set of goals for, um, for governments. If it was left to governments, nothing would happen. What we need, this is a set of goals that everyone can implement at all levels, whether it's in your household, whether it's at your college or university, whether it's in your city. And so I'm gonna look at this a little bit in terms of New York City. Why do the SDGs matter and why do we need to look at this? Well, the first thing is they are unified and unifying plan of action. They are for all all of us to work together on. It gives us a common set of goals wherever we are in the world. It also holds governments accountable. Yes, governments can't do all of it, but we can use this to hold our national governments, our city governments, our county or provincial governments, as well as we can even use it to hold our university governance sustainable. In terms of a partnership, it brings us together um, for a common cause. Universality is really important because prior to the SDGs, the Millennium Development Goals were aimed at developing countries. So for example, those of you in the Philippines had to implement them and those of us in the United States had to pay for it. The Sustainable Development Goals are universal, which means that every country in the world, all 193 countries have to implement them. And this was a major sea change because a lot of developed countries really didn't think they had to do anything. We're perfect, we know what we're doing. But what became very clear during the negotiation of these goals is that no, we have deep-seated inequalities. We have a lack of justice. We have problems with climate change. We have problems with energy use. We have all of these and we can learn from developing countries and they can learn from us. And finally, as I've noted before, this can be implemented by everyone at all levels. You don't have to implement every all 17 goals or 169 targets. That is quite a bit, but you can pick and choose what works, what do you need, and how is that going to work for where you live? And that's where New York City comes into place. So one NYC 2050 is a strategy that actually dates back to Plan YC, which former Mayor Michael Bloomberg developed during his term. Um, and that was about 10 years ago now. The plan is constantly updated and now it's updated to 2050. The idea is to do exactly what the Sustainable Development Goals do. We are trying to create a more just and livable city. We wanna reduce poverty. We wanna improve sustainability. And the plan itself focuses largely on SDG six, on clean water and sanitation, seven, energy, eight, 
decent work and economic growth. Nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. 11, obviously, sustainable cities. 12, reducing consumption and production and reducing waste. And 13, climate action. So both of these dovetail with each other. And interestingly enough, because Plan YC existed before the SDGs. So um, it's not like the plan was developed to implement the SDGs. It turned out everyone was on the same page. So I want to start looking a little bit at energy use. And I'm going not going to focus too much on transportation because Patrick did a very good job on that. But um, in terms of within the city itself, most of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions actually come from stationary sources, i.e. buildings. Um, there's a new law in New York, in the city, that requires the 50... When, when did I go mute and how did I go mute? Um, oh, well, can you hear me now? Yeah, you just went mute for a yeah. second, so not long. That was strange because yes. I didn't touch. Oops, okay, somebody, okay. So let me just, um, so there's a new law in the city to implement this plan to have um, New York City's largest buildings reduce their carbon emissions by 40% by 2030 and by 80% by 2050. Now, many of those buildings were vacant over the past year. And you could say, ah, we're well on our way to meeting that target. But the problem is that there people are going to start coming back to work. In fact, the mayor announced, Mayor de Blasio announced today that he would like to see 80% of New York City workers back in their offices, um, I believe in the beginning of April. So how can we continue to reduce those carbon emissions and reduce energy use in buildings? Um, in terms of retrofitting buildings. Most, many New York City buildings rely on fuel oil um, for their, um, for their as their major energy use. Um, how can we reduce the grid? We're seeing much more emphasis on solar panels um, being put on top of buildings um, and having mixed energy sources that Con Edison, which is the major electricity supplier in New York City, in Manhattan anyway, to be able to look for wind energy. Um, some There's some experimentation with tidal energy as well as solar energy to try to reduce our reliance on, um, on I, we pretty much do not use coal anymore for our power plants close to New York City, but reducing a natural gas um, fuel oil primarily. So just because these office buildings have been vacant doesn't mean we've solved this problem. So sorry. With regard to transportation, um, one the plan itself said we need to develop, we need to move more to electric vehicles. One way to do that is we need to increase the number of charging stations, which pretty much started at zero. Um, you can't for the city can't force everyone to move to electric vehicles, but it can force the city's municipal fleet of vehicles to be electric. And so that's part of this plan that they want all city owned vehicles to be electric by 2040. Um, that includes every garbage truck, every ferry that goes between the boroughs, every ambulance, every police cruiser, every fire truck, every city owned vehicle. The idea is to be fully plug in electric and to have electric chargers in every place where these vehicles reside when they're not in use. But how do you deal with commuters, um, which Patrick talked about quite a bit? Right now, we're seeing a reverse in a lot of the commuting because people are afraid to take trains and buses and subways, especially from the from outside of New York City. As Patrick's um, data showed, people within the city and the outer boroughs and in Manhattan um, often take subways and buses to commute, and they will also walk and cycle. But those who come in from New Jersey and from Connecticut and from upstate New York, 
as even though Westchester is not really upstate, we call it upstate because everything is upstate from New York and Long Island, they're increasingly driving to avoid taking commuter trains. So those numbers that Patrick showed from before COVID are shifting even during COVID because more people are driving. I don't own a car. I haven't owned a car since 1994. However, I was in a, I borrowed my parents' car and had to drive from Midtown where I was helping my son move back up to the Bronx where I live. And I was shocked. This was just a few weeks ago. He moved on March 1st, that I was stuck in traffic going up the Hudson River for the longest time. And here I thought, wait, nobody's working in New York. Everybody's working from home. Well, maybe everyone's working from home, but those who are commuting to New York are driving. And the traffic was as bad as it would be during a normal pre-COVID day. So how do we get people to come back to public transit, which reduces our greenhouse gas emissions uh, and reduces traffic? Um, one such idea that's been batted around for years and has, is congestion pricing. It's been used in London. There's been a fight about it for a long time in New York that do you charge a fee to people who drive their cars in Manhattan south of 96th Street, which is where the primarily, um, where most people who have to commute into New York commute into. Um, it wouldn't affect those of us up at Manhattan College because we are at 242nd Street. And so, um, but for people who work in New York, there's a lot of people shown by Patrick's data who are still attached to driving into the city. For me, I don't, I don't get it. Um, but for them, it gives freedom. You're not reliant on train schedules or bus schedules. Um, but we need to rethink how can we get people back on mass transit and how can we increase the number of people using mass transit? The third piece of the greenhouse gas emissions puzzle of New York City is waste. And this is where we tie into SDG 12, sustainable consumption and production, but it also involves energy and um, it also involves climate. So one of the things we've seen just before COVID, we actually started, um, the city started collecting compostable waste or organics as they called it. Um, which was so exciting that it would reduce the amount of trash going into landfills, having to find a home for if we could start composting organics. And because a lot of people in the city do not have yards that they can do it in, if the city picks it up and develops their own composting, and then that fertilizer can be used in city owned lands and parks all across the five boroughs. However, during COVID, they stopped organic collection. They stopped a lot of things during COVID. So part of the plan though, is to increase this to mandatory collection citywide, to develop organics processing capacity, to basically handle a million tons of food and yard waste each year. Across New York city government, where the city has more control, the idea is to get to zero waste. Not sure how they're going to do that. And I haven't seen a detailed plan, but right now what they're trying to do is divert traditional recyclables out of the waste mix. So that includes um, textiles, um, as well as paper, cardboard, metal, glass, plastics. Um, we have, have a ban on plastic shopping bags um, that just actually started right before COVID and then was suspended at the beginning of COVID. Um, and so, so the idea is partially, how do we reduce these wa this waste? And how can we reduce the emissions from the trucks that actually go through the city to pick up the waste? And I've forgotten my next slide. Yes. So one of the things that they're trying to do is to change how trash pick pickup is done. So in New York City, you have two, several streams. You have residential trash pickup that the city handles and you have commercial building trash pickup that is done by private trash haulers. Now, if you look at the map, you'll see, and this reflects very, very similarly to what we saw with transportation, is that in the primary business districts of Manhattan, um, waste collection 
dropped way down. This was due in part one, people not coming into the city, you know, to work, but a lot of wealthy people in Manhattan picked up and went to summer homes or actually rented or bought other homes to get out of Manhattan during COVID. Where is, whereas in Staten Island, which is largely res residential and slightly more suburban than the rest of the city, and in the borough of Queens, um, people were not commuting and their waste increased as they were working from home um, or you know, they didn't go anywhere, they stayed in the city. And we had parts of Brooklyn as well, where we saw the increase of waste. Even up here in Riverdale in the Bronx, we saw an increase in waste as less people were commuting and more people were at home. So one of the things that they're trying to do is change how these private trash haulers, which basically zigzag across the whole city, picking up trash from office buildings, hospitals, schools, um, universities, et cetera, and to create zones. So each truck actually will travel less miles, burn less fuel, hopefully will go electric, but also um, create fewer, less emissions. And that was postponed due to COVID as was the suspension of compost pickup. So hopefully post COVID that will actually come into play and we'll see um, less energy, less pollution and hopefully move to less waste. So we learned a couple things during COVID that I wanted to highlight before I finish. Um, the first is that in the desire for social distancing, um, the mayor opened 100 miles of streets to allow for people to be out in the streets, getting some fresh air without having to be close together. This was absolutely amazing. The picture here is from 34th Avenue in Queens, which is one example of this, where they closed a whole section of 34th Avenue in this very po you know, diverse populous borough. And they opened it up for dining, for walking, for bicycling, and it has been an incredible success story. Initially, some people were complaining, oh, what about cars? We're not gonna have ability to park. Um, but all those naysayers slowly went away as they realized what a benefit this was to have open space close by. We also started having a lot of outdoor dining because people could not eat indoors. And restaurants, I'll show a picture of that in a minute, um, started using, with the city's permission, parking spaces to create outdoor dining. Um, now, this is not a Lasallian thing, but I'm going to use this example. In the Jewish tradition, we have a holiday called Sukkot, where people are supposed to spend a week eating outdoors in temporary structures. Um, Sukkot is a harvest festival, and it commemorates when um, you would go into the fields and you would create these temporary structures to keep you out of the sun while you would have your meals while you were harvesting the crops. Well, New York City is now a city of sukkahs, which are these temporary structures. And we've it's now become Sukkot year round in New York City. Um, so can we, you know, and the outdoor dining has actually gone pretty well. And people are asking, can we continue to allow restaurants to use parking spaces for outdoor dining. The other thing that there's been a demand for as the increase in cycling to commute, because that's another way to social distance and avoid being in crowded trains or subways. Um, we have a bicycle share program in New York that was primarily centered on Manhattan. Um, it has slowly expanded to some of the outer boroughs, um, but up here in the Bronx, you can't get a city bike. Um, so can we expand the bike share program to all parts of the city so that more people can cycle? Um, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It allows people to have exercise. So that helps implement SDG3 on health. Um, and it allows for so social distancing during times of COVID. We also learned that people need green space. Yes, we had a stay at home order, but we were allowed to go to parks. 
I have been going every day for the last 373 days. I have a photo set to prove it, um, which I call my positive photo series. You'll see one at the end. Um, and New Yorkers suddenly gained this newfound appreciation for urban green space during the pandemic. Um, many saw parks as important as, as I did for mental health, for physical health. People who almost never would go to parks before started going to parks. Um, but even though all New York City residents are able to get to a park within a 10 minute walk, not all parks are created equal. Um, and if you look once again, when you get to, to Queens, um, to Staten Island, parts of Brooklyn, that um, you need greater access to quality green space. Unfortunately, in New York City, a park could be a piece of asphalt with a basketball court, not places with gardens, with trees, with animals, with birds. So we need to create more equity, and this goes into SDG 10 um, on equity and equality, so that all New Yorkers actually have access to green space, which we found to be so important during COVID. So how do we build back better? Well, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by also reduce, continuing to reduce energy use in buildings, transportation and trash collection, um, whether it's through tax incentives, whether it's through diversifying our energy mix and including more renewables, um, reducing the number of trucks that pick up trash in the city, converting our um, city vehicles to electric vehicles, et cetera. We also need to create more open streets. We need to get cars off the road um, in far more neighborhoods, um, whether it's 24 seven or whether it's during weekends or at particular times, um, we need to have better and safer bicycle lanes as more people are commuting by cycling, less street parking for cars so that we can have more outdoor restaurants and more bike lanes um, and more equitable access to green space. And going back to the SDGs, which one of the underlying issues was we can leave no one behind we need to create a more livable city for all. That means not just Manhattan, that means for all the boroughs um, and for all of the communities and whether it's in a poor neighborhood or a rich neighborhood, they all should have access to cycling, cycle, bicycle lanes, um, they should have access to green space and, um, and be able to live in a healthier city. So with that, I will say thank you with one of the positive photos that is actually in New York City. Um, and so, um, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for our speakers. Now the, the floor is now open for any questions from the audience. So please feel free to, to type in your questions in the chat box or we can do your you can do a raise of hand so we can, you know, call you if you want to ask your questions directly to our speakers. So that was a very interesting talk. And um, yeah, I, I think that the lessons learned or the examples that you showed um, would be applicable. It can be useful to other communities as well. So I just want to hear your thoughts. You've, you've presented like different impacts of, um, of the pandemic, both on the positive side and on the negative side. Um, have there been um, policies or initiatives that you think would uh, remain sustainable after this pandemic, which, will, which is a positive direction towards uh, reaching sustainability? Do you want to go first, Patrick? Sure, um, I could go first. Um, I think that it's very difficult to control New Yorkers. And what I mean by that is when COVID first started happening, um, I remember very distinctly when um, uh, there's rumors of, of, of uh, the governor looking to shut down New York City. Um, 
I was thinking to myself, you know, how on earth is he going to do that? Because New York, are, we're, we're just pretentious and, you know, we're, we're hard headed and we, we, we just don't like to listen. And, you know, I, I was surprised that uh, uh, he was able to, to, to go through with that. Uh, but this being said, I mean, I think there, you know, I personally think there's a little bit of merit in, in terms of, of, of uh, congestion pricing, in terms of changing behaviors, um, because I know that people, um, at least um, in for the people that I've I've talked about this with. Um, if you make it more expensive for people to use their cars to go into Manhattan, um, less people are going to go, most people are going to uh, have that behavior. Um, so I think there's a little bit of merit in that. And I know there's a lot of been a lot of consternation in terms of people uh, not wanting that. But um, I guess it's been successful in London. Is that correct, Pam? Congestion pricing? So I, yeah, so, you know, yeah. yeah. So I, I think there's a little bit of merit in terms of at least reducing the number of cars um, going into Manhattan itself um, by making it a little bit more costly for people to, to do that. Right, and I think, I think we've, you know, once again, we don't know what's gonna happen if we return to whatever yeah. normal is. We don't know quite what's going to happen because it's both a blessing and a curse because you can have some people you know, we need the tax revenues from tourists. We need the tax revenues from businesses. Um, there's a lot of office space where people have suddenly realized we might not need it anymore. We can just have people work from home. And so the financial impact on the city is going to be huge with that. The environmental impact is going to be huge for the better. So we need to find a balance between the economic health of the city as well as the environmental health of the city. And that's, I think, where we're at right now. And usually economics wins over the environment. And I am hoping that some of these realities, particularly for those of, of us who live in the city, who did not jump ship and go, you know, leave the city, um, recognized that we need you know, we need a more livable city and we need a more sustainable city. And to be honest, Central Park and the other parks have been quite nice without tourists, <laughs> yet we need the tourist revenues. So trying to find that balance, I think, is the challenge we're at right yeah. now. Okay, thank you for that. So now we'll go to the questions in our chat box. So the first one comes from Carlos Gutierrez. Did energy generation costs in New York go down because of lesser demand? I don't know so much about the generation cost. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked at what the, what the cost was in terms of pricing, um, but you know there, there was certainly a demand from the residential side uh, because people were staying home compared to having to go into work. So, um, in terms of cost, um, uh, at least per per unit of energy, whether it be kilo BTU, kilowatt hour, whatever it may be, um, that part I don't I don't know. But there was certainly a demand, obviously, um, with respect to people in their res own residence having to consume more energy. But as far as I could tell, I don't think, you know, just looking at my own personal electric bill, I don't think there was that much of a difference, but um, I don't know the answer for sure in terms of uh, whether the price increased per, per unit energy or not. Okay, thanks. So the next one comes from Brother Jack. Has there been any indications of increased installation of solar panels, increased production of home-based solar energy in New York City or the state? What is the solar energy like in major cities? Oh, in the Philippines. <laughs> Okay, I will ask people later if they can help me with that question. But yeah, maybe you can answer first with regards to solar energy in New York. Yeah, solar energy is, is beyond my expertise. So Brother Jack, I really can't answer that. Um, but I know there's been at least a push um, uh, where I am in Pennsylvania um, in terms of increasing the, 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 the use of, um, of so these solar panels. So they've incentivize this um, by having people who have uh, solar energy panels on their on their homes um, you know pay back the grid so to speak uh, from the energy that they 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 have uh, in their home so uh, there is at least a mechanism at least where I am uh, out here um, so but in, with respect to New York um, I don't know off the top of my head all right for the Philippines maybe I'd like to invite some of my colleagues to respond to that uh, maybe Raymond or Alvin would you have um, information on solar energy? Um, take up in the Philippines. Okay, okay, there. Hi, good morning. Hello. Thanks for that question. Uh, yeah. but, Go ahead, Damon. Or maybe Alvin might know a bit more than me. But my sense is it's uh, 
the capital costs are quite prohibitive by our standards. So it, it's uh, a bit of a luxury item, but there are, especially in the middle class, upper classes, uh, people are willing to invest in that. Um, but as the prices go down, we think that maybe the uptake will increase in the future. Alvin might have more to say. Yeah, thank you, uh, Raymond. Uh, indeed, yes, uh, the uh, cost of uh, solar panels now uh, as a system, no, a small modular system has significantly gone down. And uh, many of the families uh, who have actually who can afford, you know, such systems uh, are now uh, fully, uh, uh, you know, adopting such uh, uh, solar-based uh, lighting systems. So I think we can see uh, here in Metro Manila in recent uh, uh, pandemic, uh, you know, many, even myself, no, we have actually bought uh, these modular solar panels uh, uh, for lighting that serves our, uh, you know, lighting requirement in the vicinity for, for the whole night. And, you know, so it's now affordable and there are many uh, already uh, households who adopt such systems. They are very much uh, popular now. But in large scale, uh, you know, application, that's uh, something which is still at the moment prohibitive. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just gonna, can I add one yeah, thing sure. to that? So um, if you look around, um, Brother Jack, you will see that on the roofs of a lot of warehouses, you now see solar panels. Um, on all of the um, parking meters for, you know, when you um, are powered by solar panels. Um, that you will um, increasing, you know, number of, you know, both sort of school buildings as well as other commercial buildings are putting solar panels on the roof. Roof, And a week doesn't go by when I, why me, I don't know, but I get, someone reaches out to me because our parking garage shows up at Manhattan College, shows up on Google's, Google Maps as the perfect spot for solar panels. And my students did a study where we could actually have how much we could power by using half of the garage roof and we could leave our, um, our rooftop garden on the other half, but we could easily power Hayden Hall, the library um, and the parking garage by and possibly and possibly Thomas Hall as well with a minimum of infrastructure because everything's connected by the pedestrian bridge. So just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> and it's likely my class will do that again in the fall and try to put more pressure in terms of building back better. Yeah, great. So the next question comes from Biswajit Sarkar. So thank you so much for your nice explanations about SDG. So he is a professor from Yonsei University in South Korea. So he has a question for Professor Pam. What is the effect of SDG goals for specific healthcare and transportation issues? How do the people, uh, how can people be benefited from the SDGs? And if the SDGs do not exist, what effect will this be on healthcare and transportation? Okay, the SDGs are a set of aspirational goals to help guide people, governments, and international development assistance to achieve these goals so that people live healthier, less impoverished lives. Specifically with regard to um, healthcare and transportation, I'm just going to read two of the targets under SDG 3, which is ensure healthy lives and promote well being. For people of all ages. The ones that relate specifically to this is one, SDG 3.6, target six, three six, by 2020, which we're there, um, have the number of global deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents. That has a direct impact on health, and it really should be by 2030 at this. Pam, you were muted again. I don't know how this is happening because I'm not touching anything. Um, I don't know when you last heard me. Um, um, about the accidents. Um, yeah, the okay, good. So, and then target, that's very strange because I'm not touching anything on the computer. But anyway, target 3.9 says to substantially reduce the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals, air, water, and soil produce, pollution and contamination. Air pollution directly relates to um, energy consumption and transportation as well. So what the goals 
and these targets aim to do is to give us something to work towards. How can we reduce air pollution in cities that affect people's health? How can we um, ensure that people are healthier, but at the same time, how it all links in with improving transportation, reducing energy, um, not um, renewable energy, um, re non-renewable energy sources, and um, and reducing um, consumption of resources. So, what would happen if we didn't have it? Probably, you know, are we going to achieve it is more of a question. And I hope so. I'm not optimistic because the barriers are very high, but I still think it's important to have goals to aspire to. And if we can see an improvement in people's health because of changes in transportation and changes of pollution from transportation, I would say that's a benefit. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, the next question comes from Miriam Bongo. Uh, how do you think will providers of energy, such as electric companies, be affected with the endeavor to reduce carbon emissions by, for instance, reducing energy consumption? Well, I think it's a, a little bit of a double-edged sword for these electric companies. I think that, um, uh, you know, as, as we try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, obviously the way they produce their electricity is going to uh, be at, at risk. But I think that uh, at least from what I've heard from the students that I know who, who work at Con Ed, which is, our, which is our, with our electrical provider here in New York City, uh, I know they're trying to start um, beginning some investments in alternative energies with solar, wind, uh, tidal, and that sort of stuff. So I think the, the writings on the wall with respect to uh, the traditional ways of uh, of generating electricity in the ways they've done it in the past into more alternative means. So I think that they're at least trying to hedge their futures um, and at least looking from it from the right perspective. So um, so hopefully, you know, in the future, they're able to have a little bit more success in trying to um, get their power in those means. Um, so at least from that respect, they're on the right track. Okay, thanks. So the next one comes from Crispian Lau. So in, um, it's a it's more like a comment, I think. So increasing in solar panel application increased more in the industry sector as it was viewed as a capital investment with cal calculated returns. So I suppose this was a response to the question of Brother Jack earlier. Okay, the next one comes from Okay, I cannot pronounce the name, but Kinu. Um, it is an inspiring experience of sharing knowledge and experiences. He has a question. Do you think truly that it will be possible to continue to reduce greenhouse gas emissions after COVID-19. <laughs> we have to. We have no choice. Um, we are at the point where, um, you know, the Paris Agreement on climate change had an aspirational goal of um, limiting temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, it is looking more and more likely that we're going to hit two degrees Celsius um, within the next 10 years of temperature increase. It's going to make vast portions of the planet uninhabitable, um, either due to flooding um, and due to sea level rise, uh, due to increased storms. Um, so many parts of the planet are gonna be too hot for people to live in. Um, you're going to see increased climate migration and climate refugees, which is gonna lead to greater instability worldwide. It's a security issue. It's not just an environment issue and it's a health issue. And so um, are we on the right track? No, we have much more that we need to do. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has slowed down some of the momentum because we thought, oh, we have a, you know, we've had reduced air travel because of COVID. We've had reduced commuting due to COVID. We've had reduced energy use in commercial buildings due to COVID. Um, and that's reduced our greenhouse gas emissions. The problem is it's already bouncing back. And so it is a, just a temporary dip that isn't enough. Um, and nobody wants to live like we've lived under COVID for the last year. Um, people want to start traveling again. People want to go back into their office, into their universities, into wherever. Um, and 
once that starts, how are we going to change the way we do things so that we can start reducing those emissions? That's the research project I'm actually working on right now is with multilateral meetings. Um, what is going to be the new normal for, you know, getting countries together to negotiate in a way that we can, you know, what, what have we learned through COVID and can we actually reduce the carbon footprint of multilateralism? Um, and so this is a, is a, is a challenge and we have to, as part of this build back better, we have to rethink how we're moving and what direction, how do we recover from COVID in a way that is gonna reduce our greenhouse gas emissions while still allowing to have a bit of an economic rebound. Thanks. I have yeah. a... I, I'm sorry, yes, I just yes, want to follow on Pam's response. Um, no, I, I totally agree. I think that um, we need to at least continue this trajectory. And But unfortunately, um, you know, there, the momentum got a little bit uh, stunted because of COVID. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I follow this uh, atmospheric scientist and, you know, they show pictures of New York City and how clean it is right now because of the lack of pollution. Um, you know, with people not traveling, at least uh, because of work uh, and because people are staying home. But I think this is like a prime example of where, you know, the data is there, but, you know, you need to really try to meld it with with folks like Pam and others to, to try to get the policy into place in order for us to actually, actually um, do something about it. So it's one of those things where um, you have to try to convince people to see that, hey, you know, we're really not doing Doing right for our environment and trying to uh, change their behavior. So, you know, it's really has to be a multi pronged approach. Okay, thanks. The next question comes from Raymond Tan. So, the new US administration seems to be more open to managing climate change. Do you think that the US will commit to zero emissions in the future, like other major economies such as UK, Japan, and China? I think the Biden administration would love to. Um, the problem is we have Congress <laughs> and that. Um, you know, you know, President Biden can do anything he wants through what's called an executive order, but that can be overturned by the next president. And what we really need is legislation um, to to address this. Um, I don't want to go too much into U.S. politics, but our U.S. Senate is split 50-50 right now, with the vice president being the tiebreaker. But it currently takes 60 votes to get anything done in the Senate. There's no way we could get 60 votes to do this unless they get rid of this thing called the, this archaic thing called the filibuster. Um, one of the ways that the Biden administration is looking to address climate change is through an infrastructure bill um, that will move us towards a greener future, climate change masquerading as infrastructure. It'll be much tougher, he thinks, to, I mean, much easier, he thinks, to get the Republicans in the Senate and in the House to approve an infrastructure job that will also be a job provider for people, an infrastructure bill that will provide jobs um, and will also deal with our aging and faltering infrastructure, um, then to pass a bill on climate change. But in the infrastructure bill, you can have benefits you know, things for climate change. Similarly, the COVID relief bill had things for climate change hidden in there. So the only way that the current administration is going to get anywhere is to sort of sneak it all in um, because there is a, and I have a student working on this issue right now of how, you know, why is the Republican party so in, you know, against doing anything about climate change. And um, looking, you know, I have a student who's researching that and looking how can we bridge that gap and be able to move forward in Congress. So I'll see what her results are in about a month. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, hmm. all right. So I have the next, okay, second to the last question. Okay, um, this one comes from Brian Suniga. May I ask how in New York City, yeah. Um, engage the younger generations in living a healthy and sustainable life, especially amidst the pandemic. I, well, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this first. Um, I, and maybe Pam, Pam may want to follow up on this, but um, at least my sense is that this younger generation already has that in them in terms of 
thinking in terms of sustainability. And I know at least in my classes, I, I, I push the point that uh, this will affect your generation and you know mm -hmm. your children's generation. And um, this is an important topic um, to at least think about. Um, I have a project uh, with Vin Nguyen and uh, Donovan Vincent, uh, two, two younger students who are looking at sustainable solutions, at least alternative energy solutions in uh, West Jersey County, which is, you know, uh, tongue-in-cheek upstate New York. Um, so um, I know that they're very passionate about sustainability uh, issues um, without any prompting from me. So I think at least my sense is that, there, that this particular generation already has that uh, mentality. So I don't think it takes a lot of prodding to, 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 to have that uh, for that particular generation. You have anything to add, Pam? Yeah. Yeah. I'll just I'll just add is that I agree with everything that that Patrick just said, um, but I think I think it's also important um, for those, particularly in Lasallian colleges and universities, that we also have to promote this. That I think this is part of the Lasallian heritage, and I think it is part of our mission um, in terms of educating our students that sustainability has to be a major part of it. And um, I recently gave a presentation to the Yalu um, Youth Leadership Program on this very topic. And, um, and I think it was a very receptive audience. So I think we owe it to our universities as well as to our students to educate them about this in terms of a more sustainable life and world. And we also need to practice what we preach. We, we need to make our own physical plants more sustainable. Um, we need to reduce our electricity consumption. We have to reduce our waste. Um, we, if possible, we can have our own compost facilities. Um, we can work to install solar panels. Um, we can do a lot, reduce our water use and our waste of water. Um, there's a lot we can do on our campuses um, that not only are learning tools for our students, but also shows that we're not just teaching it, but we're doing it. And then I'll just go to the last question. I'm sorry, it's already yeah 9.30, so this will be the last one. So this comes from Clement Norris. So he says that there's a well-known French scientist, Jean-Marc Yankovici, who said that it would take an additional COVID year, uh, COVID each year to keep on reducing our carbon dioxide emissions by 5% for the next few years in order to reach a sustainable state. So do you think that um, NYC 2050 and such project will be reachable are physically doable and enough? Do you want to go first? No, I think you go first, Pam, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true. Um, you know, we are definitely not on a path to reducing our emissions. Um, we need to overcome a number of different barriers of which some of it is very political, some of it is economic, um, and some of it is structural. Um, you can't promote electric vehicles without charging stations, yet you want your electricity to be produced by renewable sources and not by coal. So, you know, a lot of that is structural as well, but you need the political will and you need to um, show the economic benefits at the same time. And we're way behind in doing all of that and that's a problem. It's a problem for all of us. And I don't know if it's going to be reachable. For the city itself, um, up until COVID, the city had been making great strides in actually implementing the agenda, which has surprised me to no end. COVID froze everything. We are now in the midst of a mayor election. Um, our mayor is term limited. And one of the things there was actually for the first time ever in a mayoral debate, a discussion on cycling and bicycle lanes was, you know, a whole mayoral debate looking at safe streets, looking at open streets, looking at cycling. Never had that been discussed before. So I see that as progress. So we're really going to have to see if these fit into the prior, you know, this has to fit in the priority of the next mayor. Particularly parts of New York City are very susceptible to sea level rise um, and including all of lower Manhattan where Wall Street is, um, including huge swatches of Brooklyn and Queens and, and Staten Island. Um, parts of the Bronx, not where we are, we're very high up, but for the city. And so 
Um, the city needs to focus both on climate change mitigation as well as adaptation. And no new mayor can avoid that. That has to be dealt with. Yeah, and, and just to follow up with that, you know, I, I totally agree with what Pam said in that a lot of it is political. Um, and, you know, when you try to have conversations with people who, who, um, who lean a certain way, and just to be polite, um, they, they, they completely um, reject the whole idea of climate change. And just as an example, um, I was uh, participating in a forum uh, a couple days ago, and one person was giving an argument that there can't possibly be uh, any, any climate change going on because all the fossil fuels are being shipped by these tankers and all the energy is being used by them. So there's no heat or anything being left off. And any person who has taken a thermodynamics class knows that, you know, there's, there, you know, the engines aren't just that, aren't that efficient. So um, it's one of those things where, you know, you have these intelligent people who are just politically motivated uh, saying this really ridiculous thing. So, um, you know, sadly, a lot of it's behavior, behavioral. And until people understand the data and are open-minded about it and, and really looking at it with an independent mind without any bias from uh, political affiliation, I think that um, we, we have a little bit of ways to go. Hey, thank you very much, Pam and Patrick. Um, just one request from me. Can, can we have a copy of your presentation so that I can also send it out to our viewers? So I hope uh, there are a lot of comments on the chat. I hope that you two can read them also. But before we close this forum, I just wanted to broadcast what we're having next month. So next month, so we're doing this at the last Wednesday of April, um, we're having Professor Raymond Tan, our Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at De La Salle University, Manila. He'll talk about engineering terrestrial carbon drawdown on SDG 13 climate action. So this will be on April 28 at the same time that we're having it now, um, 8 o'clock in the morning for those in the Philippines and um, 8 p.m. for those um, for Eastern time, for those of you in the US. So if you're interested to join us, please don't forget to register. So you can click on the QR code so it takes you to the registration portal or you can go to bit.ly slash DLSU04. Okay, so, and all our um, lectures are actually uploaded online in our YouTube channel, DLSU Sustainability Lecture Series. All right, so I guess that ends our forum for today. Thank you so much, Pam and Patrick, for um, accepting our invitation. And I hope to see you in our future events. Um, thank you. Thanks very much to both of thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pam. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, see you again. Thank, thank you, you, brother Jack. Thank you, everyone. See you. Muchas gracias. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Patrick, I saw that Dr.